elected Lieutenant Governor, Attorney General, Comptroller, and Agriculture Commissioner. Uh, what a gift to have them all here with us tonight on one stage. Please again help me welcome them. just a moment because the event itself over the three days is the Texas Public Policy Foundation's event but tonight we branch out so that we want to make sure we get as many people together as possible for such an important event and I, I want to recognize our partners in making tonight happen Americans for Prosperity, the R Street Institute, the Austin Tea Party, Eagle Forum and Empower Texans. If their representatives could stand up and if you guys could help me thank them that would be great. Fighting back. Yeah. Lots of friends. And finally, I want to quickly introduce tonight's moderator, a great friend, one of the, really the godfathers of the conservative movement with Americans for Tax Reform, someone that many of you know or at least know of. Please help me welcome back to Texas, Mr. Grover Norquist. <laughs> Before we turn it over to you, one quick thing. You have note cards and pencils on your table, so please, if you have a question, uh, feel free to fill it out during the event. Hold your hand up. There will be amazing TPPFers wandering around to take your note cards, and we'll move to Q&A probably in just a little bit. So, Grover, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you all. Okay. Um, well, we have some real talent here tonight, and I've got a couple questions Texas-wise and nationally. I guess I'd start because I'm originally from... Massachusetts, uh, and I can assure you that politicians from around the country are looking to Texas not just for interesting policy discussions, but also for how to do well with the Hispanic vote. And uh, I know that this was a big subject in each of the races you had in this last election. If you could walk through with us how well we're, you did, what you thought worked, what lessons are there for elected officials, candidates, would-be candidates in other states, not just Texas. Well, we, uh, on my campaign, the uh, first thing we did was have a Hispanic outreach person. We had uh, uh, Sylvia, Sylvia Hernandez Maddox was ours, and she's uh, been head of the Hispanic Republicans of Texas and several other organizations. And so that, that worked real well. Uh, I know Glenn and I traveled to, to South Texas, uh, several trips down there, uh, and reached out, and that, that, that seemed to work. And, and that, that was, a, was a good response. And mainly just, just be genuine. and uh, we. We really related uh, on the pro-life issue uh, uh, with with that uh, with the Hispanics. That seemed to ring bell more more than anything else that we talked with them about. And of course, my position, uh, agriculture, is is really relates to to, to that population because about over eighty percent of of farm labor is is migrant workers. So uh, it was very easy for us to reach out, and we did very very well with the Hispanic community. Okay. Yeah, I think. You know, it obviously the other party wants to create this misnomer that Republicans have nothing in common with Hispanic voters or of any nationality. In Fort Bend County, where, where I call home, or I guess maybe my wife does still, I'm moving up to Austin. That Constitution <laughs> says i got to live here. But uh, the fact is, is in Fort Bend County, where I've called home for many years now, Fort Bend County is not just the most ethnically diverse county in the state, but it's the most ethnically diverse county in the entire nation. And most people think of Fort Bend County as what? A very conservative county. So that in itself proves that that, that is really uh, incorrect information. I think really for us, one of the biggest things, not just for my campaign, but for all the campaigns, is we actually work together. And yeah. many of us talked about that through this whole process. What a concept. We were part of a team and working together. In, in talking about the message, at least for us, and many of us have the same message, is that when you look at government, you know, government's not here to work for us. It's to work for the taxpayer and for the people. When I gave my inauguration address last week, I made that very clear over and over again. And when you talk about jobs, economy, innovation, rooting out fraud and waste, why would you be against that? And so speaking that message and going and talking to people as one-on-one -on -one as individuals before you even get to party labels, and people say, well, we have a lot in common. Yes, we do. And those are the principles we stand on. And I think us working together and being on those same messages and actually being willing to be out in the public day after day after day, I think we could each give each other's campaign speeches tonight. 
Oh, yeah. We're not going to. <laughs> so you're saved. But the point being is being among the public and being among the people and shaking their hands and answering their questions, I think that resonates with people over and over again. Dan Patrick. Thank you again. Uh, I know all of us share this. We wouldn't be sitting here tonight without all of you. So thank you very much. Um, and that's like really true. You know, it's just not a compliment. Um, Many of you have heard me say this, but for those of you who have not, I'm kind of a math guy. I just do little math models. What do we have to do to win? What do we have to do to do this and do this? So if you meet 100 people a day on the campaign trail, which we don't every day, it's 3,000 people. 15-month campaign, 45,000 people, but a lot of people you see two and three times. So maybe, Sid, Glenn, Ken, myself, maybe we met 20,000 people, fresh faces, in 15 months who saw us, who heard us. Two and a half million people voted for us. All, all of us got about the same vote. So that means 2,480,000 people never saw us, never shook our hand, never took a photo with us. But why did they vote for us? Conservative issue. We treated people as individuals and not as groups. I didn't worry about whether I was in a debate in a primary or a debate in the general, I said the same thing because I believed in it. And some of you have heard me tell this story because I believe it's true. My opponent, nice lady, served with her in the Senate. We all served with her. But I said, if she walked into a room of 100 diehard Republicans and laid out her issues, more taxes, more government, don't secure the border, support gay marriage, being pro-choice, when she leaves that room, she doesn't get a vote to switch. When I walk into a room of 100 Hispanic Democrats who have never voted Republican, and I talk about standing for life and school choice and economic opportunity and lower taxes and border security, I walk out of there with 20 or 25 votes. And so all we have to do as Republicans is just be committed to conservative issues because we have said it over and over, Grover, that the Hispanic population has so much in common with us. Well, in Texas in 2014, we proved it. And if Washington Republicans and other states would follow the model of just talking about issues and don't try to cater to a group of people because they might not like our message, I'd rather lose telling the truth than win telling a lie. Amen to that. Okay. And I'll just close with this because most of you know this. There were lots of predictions that I would finish, that I'd win, but I'd barely get over 50%. That was Glenn and me predicting that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because of our strong stand on border. And Hispanic individuals and voters want border security like everybody else. We weren't mean-spirited. We just said the truth. And that's why all of us did so well. And, and Greg Abbott, again, in that same group. So that's how we did well. So Glenn was talking about how we hurt each other enough, probably well over 100 times, that we could give each other speeches. I just want to say tonight that I actually think I can give Glenn's speech better than him now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'd say vice versa too, my friend. <laughs> you need to listen to your speech more often. That's right. Thank you. But what I, I think that indicates is one of the thing, reasons I think we did so well with Hispanics is we worked hard. I mean, I saw these guys from Lubbock to Houston to Tyler, and they were out there not for a month. They weren't out there for two months. They weren't out there for six months. They weren't out there for a year. They were out there for a year and a half every day grinding it out. I saw my Democratic opponent once. I was glad to meet him. And I want you to know that I think that made a huge difference. We actually went and spoke to the voters, whether, whether they were Hispanic or other ethnic groups. We were out there meeting them, communicating genuinely. We had a consistent message, and we worked really hard. And I think our message resonates. It's a conservative message of hard work. It's a conservative message of conservative social values. 
And I think the Hispanic community identifies with that when they have the opportunity of us showing up and explaining that message. I think it worked, and I think the results of the election show that that's true. Okay. <clears throat> Immigration can change the nature of a state and its population. And because Texas has been a low-tax state and a right-to-work state, you've had quite a number of people coming from California and New York uh, into the state. How do you see that changing Texas? How does an elected official speak to a changing electorate where you're attracting people who haven't been in Texas for 10, 20, 30 years, or generations, um, and win that immigrant vote? Well, you know, there's just something special about Texas. I mean, you can't really put your hand on it, you can't touch it, you can't taste it. But there is, there is a mystique that's very special to Texas, whether it be our, our heritage that we have, or the family values that we carry, or our Western lifestyle that, that we, we cherish here and, and, and you know, kind of known uh, stereotypically uh, about, or where's just our, <coughs> our, our rural upbringing that many of us have. And as Ag Commissioner, I'm, I'm really concerned about that because as I traveled this, this year and a half with these guys, I saw many parts of Texas that are starting to look like California and New York, and that's troublesome to me. So I, I'm certainly dedicated to keeping Texas, Texas. My, my campaign treasurer, I think, said it best. He said, Texas is the last best place, and, and we don't need to change Texas. I think we, we all share that sentiment that Texas is a special place. And, and we have to continue that and not change. You know, by God, if somebody moves into our state, you need to become a Texan. Talk like Sid Miller. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I think that that's takes lots of, lots of training, Sid. Yeah. 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 Glenn, what did you run into in terms of, are, are they different voters when somebody tells well, you I'm when, down from New Jersey? I think or is so, it the same? So, several of the interesting things, if you look at the demographics, there are more Californians moving here than any other state, but you also have a lot of people moving to, to Texas that are from also other southern states. And so that's one thing that, that is in common. But the interesting thing for me as I was out campaigning out on the trail, as I travel around the state still today, the fact is as I talk to people and say, well, okay, you didn't grow up in Texas, did you? So what gives it away? I said, you don't sound like Sid Miller. <laughs> <laughs> so then we get down to some issues, and a lot of the people, why did they move to Texas? Is really because of the economic condition of where they called home, the living standard, the quality of life. So they're coming here because of those reasons, and you do have other people that are moving here that probably they do want to change Texas. But as, as one lady said, I was standing in the line and somebody said, I can't believe this line is so long to get you know, a driver's license, whatever be it. And, and the lady said, well, where I came from, and it was a very liberal state, then da 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 And the lady said, well, if you don't like it, go home. <laughs> and she said, but you can't say that. And I said, oh, no, yes, I can. <laughs> uh, I mean, I said it just in my inauguration address last week. If you want to come to Texas, you have a hardworking ethic, then we want you to come here. Red carpet's rolled out. But if you want to change taxes, you can turn around and go right back home. And I think in part, we have to continue to reinforce that. That Texas, if you want to have a quality of life, of raising your family, of instilling a faith in children, then you should come here. But if you want to change it, then you're not going to have that same opportunity. And I think the more that we talk about that and talk about really what Texas has been and why it's been Texas of our values. And I think that's what's important. Then we'll continue down the path that we're on today, which is good for Texas. Dan? Uh, I'm going to, since I think they've given a really good answer, I'm going to just, I want to add a little bit more to sure. the first question about how we won. We were handed a gift. And that gift was two candidates at the top of the ticket who were known for their staunch support of abortion. And it has exposed the Democrats for the first time in a way to their Hispanic voters in a way that they will not get those votes back because the Democrat party will never become a pro-life party or they lose everyone else. 
And uh, you've heard me say this, some of you around the room. People, you say, well, Dan, I'm really worried about this. I'm worried about Texas turning Democrat. You know, it's inevitable. I said, no. The people who need to be worried are all those Democrats sitting in a room. How are we going to keep the Hispanic voters? I debated, as many of you know, uh, Mayor Castro back in April. People said, why would you do that, Danny? You're not even running against him. But I had an opportunity to go on <coughs> Univision for an hour without being filtered, without being edited, and talk to the people of Univision. And there was a moment in the debate, because he was hammering me, Republicans don't care about immigrants. We don't care about you. And I said, let me say something, Mayor. If a woman crossed the border illegally tonight, and I wish she wouldn't, but if she didn't, she was pregnant. The difference between the two of us, I will do everything I can to save the life of that child who has yet to be born, and you will not. And he didn't know what to say. And he said, well, everyone knows my position. I said, well, maybe they don't. Why don't you tell the audience your position? My point is, and, I, and he did. He said, well, I'm pro-choice. The point is that in the Hispanic community, that issue is critical. And, and so I think that, that we were given this gift, and, and that combined with the hard work, uh, that combined with reaching out Greg Abbott, who could not be here tonight, did an incredible job of reaching out. He had more staff, more money to do a lot of those things. It all came together. And uh, so I feel really good about it. But now, we have to deliver. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have to deliver. I think the solution to the California, New York, immigrant situation could be easily solved by Dan and the legislature if they'd pass strong border security along the northern border. <laughs> that's, what, that's my suggestion. Is that the Oklahoma, Texas? Hey, wherever they're coming from. Louisiana, New Mexico? I actually, you know, I, I have a lot of clients that have uh, come to, I live in a county that has grown dramatically. Um, I don't know if Judge Self is here, my county judge, but it's, 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 uh, it's grown dramatically in the last 10 years, almost doubling in size, a little over 800,000 now, is that correct, Judge Self? 850, I was a little off on the growth. But it's not just people from Texas that are moving there. It's people that are moving for opportunity. They're coming from California, they're coming from New York, they're coming from all over. And my experience, anecdotal as it is, is that a lot of these people really understand the values of Texas. They're, that's why they're here. And I'm not convinced that the people that are moving here are going to vote Democratic. And somebody, I, I heard this on the campaign trail, I cannot attribute it to anything because I can't remember where it came from. But somebody told me they'd done a study on the people moving here and that it was well over 60% are voting Republican. And so I'm not, I really don't, I don't need the border security thing, really. I, I really do need, I think it really is true that a lot of these people are moving here because of the opportunity and that there's a, a relatively good chance that they're going to vote Republican, especially if we continue to stay strong and we continue in our conservative values and we continue with our, our hard work and our, and our conservative message. <clears throat> just those questions are raised in New Hampshire, and it turns out that the southern New Hampshire is the most conservative part of New Hampshire. The people who flee from Massachusetts vote for lower taxes, uh, and that's why they move to New Hampshire. So they actually do tend to be the more conservative part in the state. Uh, school choice. Uh, we now have a number of states that have school vouchers. In Louisiana, about 380,000 students have an opportunity for up to a $5,000 voucher to go to public or private. Schools, 500,000 in Indiana, uh, 200 and somewhere between 200 and 300,000 in uh, Arizona, and the number of states like Wisconsin and Florida have tens of thousands. How do you see that playing out in, in Texas? Uh, is, is this something that can pass legislatively? Is it supportive? Do people see uh, the same interest here that other states are moving in? Ken, can we start from the top? Sure. Uh, you know, school choice is something we've worked on for years in Texas, and I'm hoping as we've gotten a more and more conservative legislature that we can pass something even as simple as a pilot program. But it's been, it's been very challenging. Typically, we've had most of the Democrats opposed to it, and oftentimes we've had rural Republicans opposed to it. So it's been hard to put that coalition together. But at the same time, we also have a more conservative Senate than we've ever had. We have great leadership in the Senate. We have uh, probably a, at least a larger number of conservatives in the House. So I'm, I'm hopeful, but it's definitely a challenge 
in, in both houses to, 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 to get that by. And maybe you've thought through, we tried, actually Dan had a, uh, had a, a really good pro-choice, or pro-choice, pro pro-school uh, choice, choice uh, piece of legislation last session that I uh, co-authored. And even as a chairman of, of education, it was very challenging to, uh, to get it out of even uh, the education committee. So you might want to talk about that process of even getting it out of the Senate. Yeah, and, and many of you were at the lunch yesterday, and we spent about an, an hour and a half on it, so I don't want to be repetitive. Um, the first thing we have to understand is we're not going to lose this battle. We're not going to quit. We will prevail. It took seven years to pass the sonogram bill, and really, school choice had set on the back burner until we picked it up last year, and when I became education chair. And Eddie Lucio from the Valley supported it. Uh, we're a couple of votes away. Uh, I believe we will pass a school choice bill, and if we don't, uh, you know, I'm, I may not win every battle, I'll be in every fight, and, and uh, those who defeat us will limp off the battlefield. We are, uh, it is the most important, and I mean politically speaking, figuratively speaking, um, we have no choice but to give parental choice to every parent and Senator Graham talked about this yesterday, even looking at broadening it so everybody is there. But the Republicans, I think, are ready to vote for it. And we just need an education process, not with our rural Republican legislators. They support it, but they get pressure from their superintendents. And they're against it, and there's really no reason for them to be against it. Um, and so I, I believe we can do that. A lot of it will depend on, um, uh, you know, this session and... and um, and the support we get from the community, but, but we have to pass it. You can't, so many, look, the people in this room, you're really successful. You're really successful. Um, but your success is diminished to some degree if everyone in Texas doesn't have the opportunity to be as successful as you are. And so our children and our grandchildren lose out in the future if the young people of today who live in our inner cities, who are not graduating from school, um, who don't have a future because they don't have a quality education, if we don't lift them up, then we all lose. And, and I believe, um, I know this, the parents of inner city students in failing schools want it. And the reason we know it is because we have 150 to 175,000 people in charter schools, mostly minority, and we have another 150 to 200,000 people on the waiting list. They are waiting for Superman, if you've seen the movie. And in Texas, we'll do all we can to deliver. I'll, I'll be very short on this answer just because I think they both covered it. And I think the opportunity is getting closer and closer. It's kind of uh, the old bum Phillips with the Oilers. If any of y'all grew up in Houston, you know, last year we knocked on the door, this year we beat on the door, and then next year we're going to da, 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 kick the door in. And so I think that kicking the door in is getting a little bit closer. Uh, but, the fa but the fact is, is this, one of the things that's always been amazing to me is the arguments against why. They said, well, you're taking money out of the public schools. Well, who pays money to the public schools? <laughs> yeah, I just wrote a check. Uh, it's the taxpayer's money. And the fact is, is my three young children, my, my fourth grader, my kinder, and my kinder, we have them in public schools. But we're blessed that we live in an area where we have a good quality school. But then there could be one of our children that has certain situations and that school district's just not the right match for them. And I pay money and the time period that my children are in school is just a short period of my life. I paid property taxes before they got into school. I'm pretty certain there's a chance I'm going to be paying taxes after they're in school. So to talk about a short period of time where I can take a portion of my dollars and educate my children to give them that opportunity that I had, whether it's in the public school, whether it's in charter schools, whether it's a voucher to take, go to some other school or to homeschool. Not every kid is the right, the, not all kids are the same. And so I, it's amazing to me the arguments against, and I just still have yet, what am I not getting of how those arguments resonate with some people because it's the taxpayer's dollars and the parents need to be able to have that opportunity, that choice.
But in short, I think we're getting closer to that day and that opportunity in Texas. And Texas is going to be better off because of it. And Sid, why do we have trouble getting support from elected officials in more rural areas for well, I, I, I can explain that because this is helped lead to my defeat as a House <laughs> member. In, in 2011, uh, of course, I filed the uh, sonogram bill in the House and we passed that. Dan was co authored on that. It was great legislation, saved 10 to 15,000 babies a year. But I also filed a school choice bill called Taxpayer Savings Grants. Well, this, this one actually put money back in the public schools, when, if the program would have been successful, would have implemented it, public schools would have actually had $200 more per student. Because in this instance, the student left and only took half the money with him, and in the, in the, in the, they had less students to teach and more money left to do it with. So it, it was a win-win, but you couldn't convince teachers unions and superintendents that it was a good uh, deal, because when it boiled right down to it, it wasn't about the kids. It was about the teachers and the teachers' union and what was best for the teachers. Uh, so that, that made it difficult. Uh, and they came after you. Oh, yeah, they came, they came after me, and the teachers' union organized, and Planned Parenthood organized, and uh, uh, got Democrats. <coughs> actually, my former, got my former Democrat opponents to write letters and ask the Democrats to cross over and, and vote in my primary, and, and I was defeated. But, you know, I, I would tell people, those teacher union people come in and sit down to argue with me. I said, look, where'd you go to school? Oh, I'm a graduate so-and-so. That's good. I said, y'all realize that, that we've had a voucher program here in Texas for a long time. This is, this is not a new deal. Oh, we don't have a voucher. We'd never have. We'd never do that. I said, did you use a, a Pell Grant or a GI Bill to go to college? Well, yeah, I was a veteran. I used it. I said, that, you know what that is? That's a government check to go to school your choice. That's a voucher. I thought their heads were going to explode. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, we need to get there. And hey, we don't own this idea. This movement started, the Democrats started this movement. Right. The inner city uh, that, that have no, no choice for their schools, that are in failing schools, and, and they're locked in there. You know, we didn't dream this up. The Democrats are the one that were screaming for school choice. Get us out of here. Get us out of here. This is not good for our children. So we, we just have to find a way. And I think with the leadership we have and Dan Patrick and the conservative makeup of the Senate, that we can get that Senate, we'll pass that out and send it to the House. And hopefully this time the Senate will be brave enough and smart enough and, and know that the people of Texas are deserving enough to pass a school choice bill. Recently the price of oil uh, has dropped and this has some effect on Texas's budget. As you look forward for opportunities uh, to uh, cut taxes in Texas, how will that be affected by the drop in oil prices? And what are the priorities in what tax rates may be reduced in Texas? Property taxes, um, the margins tax, what, what are we looking at in terms of where we think we can make uh, progress? Well, I had a, a press conference today, and you can go to the Senate archives and watch it when you get home this weekend, uh, or probably find it on the internet somewhere. And I was asked this question. I laid out our vision for the Senate for this year. And I was asked that question at the end. Was I concerned about it? And I said, you know what? Of course I'm concerned about it. Oil and gas is such a vital part of our economy. I said, but every time we have an economic downturn, the first thing I always hear is, well, what are we going to do about funding for education? What are we going to do about funding for this government? What are we going to do about funding? I said, you know what? What are we going to do about the people out there who need more money in their pocket? So the first thing we're going to do in a downturn is, is eliminate tax cuts. This is exactly the time when you have to put more money in people's pockets so they can keep the economy going. And I said, I want to tell you something, Lieutenant Governor, this session, we're going to put the people first over government entities. We're not backing up on tax cuts. Obviously, we live in a real world, and things can impact the level of those cuts. But we, we, we expect to be bold, and we expect to be big in tax cuts. And then I'm going to trust my good friend here, the controller. <laughs> 
What is he head next? Monday he's supposed to announce? Yeah, I think, aren't you him? Aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Next yeah. Monday. That's but look, we have so many oil and gas people here, experts, you, you know more about it. And you've forgotten more about it than we know. But, but we just have to keep forward, moving forward and be prudent and smart uh, in how we go about this. Yeah, it's, it, oh, go ahead. Yeah, it, go ahead. It, it, it's interesting to me as the guy who's supposed to give the revenue estimate, so I hear next Monday at 10 o'clock. So stay tuned. Uh, everybody wants to talk about oil prices, and, and that's a fair question. Obviously, Texas, we're very blessed. We're very rich in, in our natural resources, and it's treated us well over the years. But if you look at our economy, we're not the 1980s. Texas is a very diverse economy. Now, oil and gas is very important to this state but a lot of sectors of the economy are very important to this state. And, and if you look at the fact, I think it's interesting because I think uh, many of the other oil producing nations are trying to figure out what's going on and part of that is what's going on here in Texas because we're such a big part of that production. And so one of the things, if you look at the legislative session that's coming up and they're the decision makers and they're going to make these decisions and Dan's taking a stand and he said look we're going to put the taxpayers first which to me is the right answer but as the person who's given the revenue estimate you know I've talked over and over again that the Texas economy is doing really well we have a strong economy so is it something that we need to continue to monitor like every sector absolutely in my office there is not a day that goes by that we are not talking about what is the state of the economy for Texas? And as I see things changes, you will be the first to know. The public will be the policymakers. But I think the fact is, is don't, don't lose sight that Texas in the last several years since the last recession has gained almost 1.2 million jobs. Now, what does that mean? We have been almost the job creating engine of all 50 states is right here. And I made a comment last Friday, imagine if the federal government said, hey, Texas is two thirds of all the jobs since the recession, why don't we take a page out of their playbook? Now I said it last week, don't hold your breath. But the fact is we'd be a lot better off. And, that, and that's really putting the taxpayer first, putting money back in people's pockets. Ken? Yeah, I was gonna say, just like Grover, just like when I was in the Texas House, just like when I was in the Texas Senate, now that I'm Attorney General, every chance I get to vote against tax increases, I'm going to do. I just want you to know that. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. You know, it's interesting that uh, liberals are always wanting more taxes and more spending, but one of the challenges that I found in the legislature was actually when we had too much money and a surplus. People wanted to create all these new programs and spend more money. And it was actually sometimes much harder as conservatives to fend off the spending when we had surpluses. When we have a downturn in the economy, if we do have one, it's actually an opportunity to cut spending because we're not in a position where we're not spending enough. Our government has grown in Texas plenty fast, just like it has in, in, the, in the federal government. So in my opinion, if the revenues that are, are, are less, then as Dan said, this is not the time to go take more money out of people's pockets. This is a time to, to if anything, cut taxes. Sid. Well, you know, the oil and gas industry, it, it, the Texas has done very, very well with it, but uh, it's, it's always boom or bust. You know, we're going through one of those, we just went through a, a boom and, and our economy is great, but now we're feeling that downward pressure. But our second largest industry in the state has always been the glue that's helped our state together long before there was an oil and gas industry, and that's agriculture. And we, we sell $100 billion worth of agricultural products in this state, and it's, and it's steady. Instead, it kind of ebbs and flows a little bit, but but actually the the drop in fuel prices is is, is a good thing for the agriculture sector. So something that's bad for one is is, is good for us, and we may be the hope hopefully not. We don't want to be the number you know surpass oil and gas, but we are the nation's largest exporter of ag agriculture goods. We lead the nation in in lots of areas. We <coughs> produce uh, enough beef in this tex in, in t just in Texas to produce 18 billion beef patties, hamburger patties. That doesn't mean anything to you, but if you line them end to end, that would circle the earth 400 times. That's lots of hamburgers. My family eats we, their fair share, we, so you don't quite circle the earth that many we, times with the Hager kids. We we're one of the nation, lead the, one of the largest producers of milk in the nation. 
We produce enough milk to fill up Reliance Stadium. Four times. Six times. Oh, six. Six times. <laughs> there, there's a you reason you're not the ag commissioner. Right. <laughs> but we, we, we lead, lead the nation in wool and mohair. And Tell them about cotton and blue jeans. Cotton, Two cotton, billion. Cotton. Two billion. Cotton. Five, five. We've heard this. Five billion is going up. Five, five. He's it was changing. two billion yesterday, yes. and it was four stadiums no, yesterday. He's You're changing no, the numbers. It's, 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 it's five <laughs> million bales of cotton. But, but two billion, two billion pairs, pairs of, of blue jeans. jeans. That's right. <laughs> See, he's making my point that Texas is still doing pretty good. So we're we're going to yeah. Texas. Texas will, actually, one in, one in seven jobs. One Actually, Sid, seven jobs Sid's, Sid's been in office is. one day, and ag Related. has gotten better in one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <absolutely. laughs> yeah. Three billion more <laughs> bales of cotton in a day. Let me tell you, you've done a great job there. Let me tell you what. Um, let, 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 let me, one point to make about all this, to put this in perspective. Roughly, when, when I came to the Senate in 2007, we passed a budget somewhere $170 billion. Last year, we passed a budget $200 billion. So even though we had that downturn between 2010 and 2011, we still have grown spending in the state 30 billion. So don't tell me even in a downturn, we can't send some money back to the folks. A reminder, if you have a question, to write it down on a card and raise it up so people can <laughs> pick them up here. Um, on ag, <laughs> what Obama did recently on Cuba, does what as an opportunity for the Texas? Well, you know, I, Something, obviously is, is, is the cheerleader and chief marketeer for agricultural products. <laughs> I, I'm, I'll jump at any chance to, to sell more Texas products. I think we got our britches traded off. I think you should let the Texas Ag Department make that trade. We'd have done a lot better because uh, we gave up a lot but didn't get anything. But basically, uh, We've been selling agricultural products in Texas to, to Cuba for a long time. Uh, we just have to go through a third party, and, but basically we, they have to prepay. Uh, you know, Cuba's broke, so what this does is just say we'll offer them credit. Well, basically the same thing. They, you know, they don't have any money, so the credit's no good. Uh, it's also not all that big a deal. It's, a, it's like us selling to Los Angeles County same number of people, except those people have money out there. That's a better market <laughs> for us. Uh, I think where it does help our, our agriculture economy, where we can put some products in there that we haven't been able to before, is our timber products. We haven't had that going in, so and they really need our timber products. Also, uh, agricultural machinery, uh, they don't really have the money to buy new tractors and new combines but it'll create a whole new market for our used farm equipment, which is great for the farm and ranchers. You know, get rid of that junk iron at, at decent prices and allow them to reinvest and buy more uh, American products, more tractors and, and things like that. So I, I think it'll be good for the economy all over. Uh, I don't think we're gonna sell them a whole lot more product that, than we have been, uh, but most people didn't, didn't realize we've been selling them rice and sorghum. Matter of fact, I have a, a trade mission down there in March uh, to, to market more grain sorghum to them. So we'll, we'll continue to do that and capitalize on it. Okay. Uh, Texas was once an independent country, and then you signed up for statehood, which means Washington gets to make a lot of the rules that Texas has to live under. Uh, Texas has been a little louder than some other states in suggesting that these are mistakes or they're pushing back on, on uh, some of the excesses from Washington. What is the relationship now, and how can it be improved from Texas' perspective to maximize freedom Elect and a Republic here? into the White House in 2016 would be a great first step. <laughs> and one from Texas would be even better. While we wait uh, for that, <laughs> given that the EPA can mess with you and, and, and you've got the federal government having rules on Medicaid and other stuff, What's the most annoying stuff Washington's doing? Are there things that, that you, one can push back, or some of the stuff you just have to suffer through? I, I mean, I, I, we're going to be. Can I you sue them? Yeah, we're going to sue them. Um, it's. We, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, um, 
it's interesting. When I came in the legislature, we focused on state issues. That's our job. And I noticed it, and I think Glenn noticed it, and Sid, and, and Dan, when Obama came into office, the focus really changed, not just for the attorney general, not just for the governor, for the legislature. Suddenly, we were dealing with all these different issues related to the federal government, and that has only intensified, and in my opinion, the next two years are going to be worse. It's not going to get better. Obama has no election in front of him. Uh, we see more of this coming from the EPA, whether it relates to CO2 emissions, Endangered Species Act. Um, we're, we're literally under assault, and Texas particularly is under assault, and, and we're going to have to fight back with every possible tool we have, and we're going to end up in court with them, um, I think, even more than we have. So, you know, Greg Abbott said, you know, he got up in the morning, came to work, sued Obama, went home. <laughs> I'm going to be doing the same thing, I have no doubt. What, what are the top ongoing uh, legal battles, and what are the next two or three? Well, so we have, well, we actually had two, we have two Fifth Circuit arguments this week. One was on, uh, yesterday was HB2, which was our pro-life bill. We have another one uh, tomorrow on marriage, defending our constitutional uh, marriage amendment. We have uh, voter ID coming up. We have redistricting coming up. We have our school finance case. It, it's almost endless. And then we have numerous EPA cases likely to be showing up very soon. Are there non-legal strategies that... Texas is looking at? Well, on the EPA issue, which will cripple uh, America, it will double or triple your utility costs. Um, which if you hurt, have utilities. If you have utilities. Um, the, I was at a conference in Washington with lieutenant governors from across the country, and so we had some great speakers to come in, and their answer was what Texas already figured out. We're just going to tell Washington no. And it will take them more than two years to address our no. And so we have to work really hard again in 2016. And this will be the year to get on a bus and go and campaign for someone in some state. Um, but we're going to have to say no to the EPA. What they're doing on the EPA guidelines is very clear. I think they know it's unconstitutional. But in the interim of that court battle, uh, if they close down our coal plant, um, and at the end of the day the Supreme Court says what they did was unconstitutional, it will be too late to go. It'll be too late to go back and retrofit or rebuild those plants. We will have moved on, and I believe that's their end game. They don't really care if it's constitutional or not. They just want to attack, particularly the coal industry, and so I really believe we're just going to have to say no and let them sue us and whatever they want to do. But You know what's remarkable, really, and is that if you look at the case that we recently filed on the president granting amnesty to 4 million illegals, it's remarkable. We have 25 states that have joined that lawsuit. I don't know that we've ever had a lawsuit against the federal government where half the states in the United States joined the lawsuit. And so it's not just Texas. We're leading the way. and. You know, thank God that Greg Abbott has been there for the last, you know, six years while Obama was there, leading the way, inspiring other, particularly Republican states, to stand with us. And so there's a real collegial, tight working relationship among at least Republican AGs to say, look, we're not putting up with this. We're going to fight back and we're going to fight back together. And if Texas leads the way, we've got the resources to fight back. 25 states. 25. Mm -hmm. Well, that's almost half of the 57. That's right. <laughs> yes. That's right. Your math is better than mine. You know, in, 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 in the controller's office, my predecessor, Susan Combs, the legislature had decided to give her the responsibility of dealing with endangered species. Uh, it was not too long ago. I was giving a speech, and somebody said, okay, comptroller of public accounts, you deal with accounting, you deal with taxes, you deal with the financing, the banking, you give the revenue estimate. Why don't they just call you treasurer? And I said, well, it kind of hard to fit in economic issues and endangered species in that title. And they said, I'm sorry, you deal with what? So, well, the fact is, is if you look at the course of the Endangered Species Act, you had just a few species in the first number of years, and now there's just a proliferation of potential listing. And once a species gets listed, it never gets off the list. Two just hundred. take, yeah, Two hundred. And, and, and potential another 1,200 coming and 100 and roughly 70 impacting Texas just today 
one of the many meetings as we talked about the potential listing of the monarch butterfly. Now, do you have any idea how wide the swath of the monarch butterfly is? I see as those it goes things from everywhere. Canada all the way to Mexico. And I wonder whose president was it that has talked to the Canadian premier as well as the Mexican president, and we're going to do something about that. Well, if the Dune Sage Lizard was important to the Permian Basin, what do you think the monarch butterfly will be from Texas? And so someone has to make sure that I would prefer the private sector solve our problems. But somebody, because this issue is so big, and this is something that Susan talked a tremendous amount about, somebody has to really look at it from the economic side of what is this going to do to Texas if you shut down the Permian Basin because of the Dune Sage Lizard? Because no one has the science to determine where it's at. So our office is coordinating that effort to find out where is the lizard because in essence, why would you stop drilling everywhere when it's not there? And so that's a task that, believe it or not, the controller's office has, which is not litigation, but really it's being ahead and in front of to protect really us and our economic opportunities that we have in this state. And so we're, we're going to continue the mantle of that unless the legislature decides to tell somebody else to do it. Well, Grove, as I, as I traveled around the state, there's one question i got to ask consistently. They say, what, what's the greatest problem facing our Texas ranchers and farmers? And they know that water my, was my number one issue, and we're going through a four-year drought, and, and they always expected me to expound on the drought and how important that is to agriculture. But I would, I would always start out and tell them, look, God's going to give us rain someday, and that problem will be solved. But the greatest threat to the farm and ranch is the overreaching federal government. Whether it be the BLM trying to seize 90,000 acres of farm and ranch land up on the Red River without any compensation at all. Uh, and, the, and those farms have been in the same families forever. It's, it's patented land, deeded, been sold. The school districts collect taxes on it. Or, or it be the... Uh, uh, EPA, trying to usurp states' rights, uh, usurp the Supreme Court, Congress, through the uh, waters of the U.S., uh, by rule, lay claim to all the waters in the United States. The state actually is, is responsible for about 60% of our, our waters, according to the Clean Water Act. If they lay, they lay claim to that, it will, you can't live up to EPA regulations on your farm or the oil and gas industry. In, in, we have, you know, many others, the fish and game, the wildlife, uh, endangered species. You know, there's 200 on the proposed list just, just for Texas. And there's a lot of other of those uh, three-lettered fe federal agencies that, that are, that are a, a threat to us. So uh, it's a shame that we have to, in this, and I agree with Ken, it's just basically happened in the last six years that we have to fight our own federal government for our, for our very lives. Uh, you have a number of uh, questions people have written down. If you do have another uh, one you want to add to that, write it down and hold it up so staff can uh, get a copy. Is the Keystone Pipeline still important to the Texas economy? Well, I, I, I'll just comment on the agriculture end of it, and these guys can do, do the rest. Uh, that's vital to Texas agriculture. You know, three years ago they said, if we don't build a Keystone Pipeline, Canada's going to sell all that to all the China. Well, that didn't happen. They're still sending it down to the Texas Gulf Coast, except they're sending it in rail cars. The amount of rail traffic is tenfold, has increased tenfold since then. Well, that, is, that affects agriculture. We can't move our commodities. We can't, get, we can't get rail cars. We can't move our timber out of East Texas. We can't get corn to our, our poultry houses in East Texas, and, uh, feed and, and uh, up, up in the Panhandle in West Texas to our to our big dairies up there and our feed lots. So what that means, all of that has to now be trucked in uh, over our road system, which is already, you know, o overburdened. Uh, so and that causes even more transportation problems. Uh, uh, so these people that, that, that object to the Keystone Pipeline because of environmental <coughs> concerns are nuts. It's a whole lot safer. <laughs> Well, they are. I mean, that, that's crazy. Which is safer? Send that all down here in a pipeline that's sealed and secure? Or send it on rail cars 
hundreds of thousands of rail cars that can be derailed. So I I'm, think I'm uncertain. How does he get, feel on this issue? Get that. Uh, we, we've got to get it built on, on the agriculture side. So. Okay. Uh, yes. I have a great question here, but I'm going to narrow it down if I can to just public policy issues. What is the one issue that keeps each of you up at night? I mean, for me, it's it's the it's this fight with the federal government. Texas has <clears throat> done fine on its own. We've we've been successful politically. We've been successful economically. Uh, we're not perfect by any means, but we're a successful state. And our, our model of of as our governor says, you know, less regulation, lower taxes, less litiga uh, litigation. It's worked in Texas, and. You know, it's interesting that the Democratic states are not in that position. Uh, Washington and Illinois and, and, and Michigan and New York are struggling because they've chosen to ado adopt different policies. And I'm convinced that the federal government looks at us as a success. And they've said, look, they're not going to regulate, they're not going to tax, and so we're going to do it from the outside in. And, and that is critical. This issue is critical to our survival as an economic force and to our, our liberty and freedom. And so that's the issue that, that, that motivated, I think, me and many on this stage to spend the last year and a half of our lives communicating with voters and, and basically sacrificing our last year and a half to communicate this a critical issue because I think we are at a really critical time for our country. Yeah. That's a great question. I was a really great question. There are several, but if I had to put one at the top of the list, and I qualify it this way, um, our number one job, any public official, number one job is public safety. Protect your life. If you lose your life, if your family loses their life, a lot of these other things don't matter. Obviously, until you lose your life, it doesn't matter for sure. I'm very concerned that even though we're doing a much better job on the border, that we have the potential of terrorists crossing the border. Rick Perry has used the number, so I'll go by his number. Of, uh, we've apprehended over 700 people. Uh, we're seeing an increase, an uptick. I'm talking 700 people from countries of interest uh, where terrorism um, uh, emanates from. Uh, since we moved the National Guard to the border, our apprehensions in some weeks down 55, 60 percent. It's really working. I said today in, in uh, my press conference that we're going to fund border security this year in the next budget at the highest level ever. I'm going to put the money back that has been cut, sadly, um, for the National Guard to continue from August through the next two years. Um, so the thing that keeps me up at night is if you look at what happened in Paris, I mean, we can have the homegrown lone wolf, but uh, we're, doing a, we're doing a much better job. But uh, I'm concerned about terrorists crossing our border and the drug cartels that continue to pump drugs in to America that kill our youth and kill the hopes and dreams of many people. So at the end of the day, a country that cannot secure its border um, uh, is in real danger. Look what's happening in England, Europe. So that keeps me awake. Yeah, that keeps you awake. Uh, as, as with Dan, I that, that is a very good question. And the first thing that, that comes to my mind that keeps me up at wake is I really think back to my three kids being that I have three young children and my wife and I have this conversation quite frequently is what is the future for them here in Texas? And when I say that, many of you think, well, from an economic and opportunity perspective, really it's about a value system is what is the values that this state has that I grew up in? Where I'd said just last Friday, I mean, I was blessed. A lot of people say, oh, well, he's just that farm kid. Yeah, well, that farm kid taught me out there about character, integrity, honesty, hard work. It's called a value system. And so probably what keeps me up at, what, awake at night more than anything is that value system and how I think there's a complacency among people not to stand up for what your values are and wear them and be proud of them. And I guess that's probably what concerns me more than anything, half-heartedly, 
What also keeps me awake at night, being the father of two young, beautiful girls, is who's that guy that they plan to bring home someday? <laughs> that's probably the one, and that's not a policy issue, but that's a father issue, but that really is the one that keeps me awake at night. But that was a diverge from your question, but that not is sure. the real honest answer. Yeah, my wife snores. Ken, that's I need why. some advice. You got daughters much older. Okay. The thing that keeps me up at night usually is bad Mexican food. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, actually I, 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 sleep, I sleep pretty well, uh, but I, I do have some long-range concerns as, as I hold those two grandbabies on my lap, you know, and I, I, I have to wonder, you know, when they have grandbabies to hold in their lap, will we be a socialist country, will, will we be a Muslim country, you know, what, are we doing enough, are we handing off? this country to the next generation, the following generation? Are we, putting, are we putting the right safeguards in place to those generations so they can, they can enjoy the bounties of this country like, like, like we have and like our parents before us and the ones before them? So it, the day-to-day the, the -day stuff doesn't keep me up, but that long-range stuff mm -hmm. uh, I've read about a, a little bit. Okay. I've, I have, I have a general rule that says don't sm sweat the small stuff, and uh, I judge it like this. Uh, if it's not going to make a difference in my life five years from now, it's small stuff. If it's going to make a difference five years or longer, I, it's okay to sweat it a little bit. You need to think about that. Okay. Uh, short essay question here. The cities of Texas, especially Houston, are having a problem with uncontrolled pension costs. Their ability to negotiate with their unions has been uh, tied by the legislature in Austin. What can we expect from this legislative session to protect cities against bankruptcies and pensions? It is definitely a problem uh, for the most part if you look at government in America. Uh, our cities are run by Democrat mayors. In fact, I think of the 20 largest cities in, in America only Indianapolis and San Diego have Republican mayors. And so you have Democrats in these Republican states, you still have Democrats making really bad policy decisions. Uh, Bill White, when he was the mayor who ran for governor the last time, when he was mayor, just wrote whatever it took to get the sport to win, not caring about the future. Now, you know, we all sit down with police and fire, and I will tell you that if there's a group of folks that I'm always going to give benefit to, it's anyone who gets up in the morning and when they leave the house, part of their job description for the day is if they have to sacrifice their life to save mine or my family's, uh, I'm going to give them a little bit of benefit of the doubt. However, there is a limit to everything we can do. And so I think we have to begin as, immediate, as quickly as we can uh, because the system will crash. And if we've made promises to people and you keep your word in these cities and their Democrat mayors need to find a way through it, but you're going to have to reform a system so the new people coming in um, are able still to support those promises we've made. Um, or the truth is every city in America will be like Detroit. It will default on its plans and there won't be anything for anyone at the end of the day. So I think you keep the promises you've made and you find reform um, so that the new folks coming in uh, have a system that makes sense that we can afford. Because when a city gets in the point where, where in California where they have this a lot, um, they may be paying for three de police departments at one time. The one that retired the first time, the one that retired the second time, and the ones that are on the job. And uh, that'll just bankrupt it. It's part of California's problem. Somebody else want to? Okay. Um, there's been some discussion today about the Article 5 movement, the effort to amend uh, the federal constitution by calling a convention through the states. Uh, the balanced budget amendment's been, has 24 states that have moved on that. There's an effort on regula regulations um, and the convention of the states. What should Texas do? Should it join this effort to call for an Article 5 convention, limited or broader? You know what, I'm, I'm, I'm for anything that gets the federal government under control, and if this is a tool to do that, I think it's a, it's a great idea for Texas to participate 
and anything that would do that. Um, I do have to answer Glenn's question he asked because he said what kept him up at night was his, these boys that are dating his daughters. Well, I have three teenage daughters, and so that what I do, Glenn, is I make them come talk to me, put them under a lot of pressure, and then when they walk out the door, I look them in the eye and I say, don't do anything to my daughter that you wouldn't do to me. There you go. <laughs> Has one of those boys ever tried to kiss you? <laughs> no, sir. Good, then it worked. <laughs> okay. Dan Patrick and Ken, what are you going to do to get to the bottom of the corruption at the University of Texas? Well, you know, I talked about this on the campaign in a debate towards the end of the campaign because we really hadn't had the question. And I've been pretty busy the last 15 months and don't know every detail. But I believe this, that it's going to be really difficult to get private citizens like yourself to step up and volunteer to serve on a board of regents if when you're trying to do your job, you're threatened with impeachment and potential indictments. And at the end of the day, Again, I don't know all the right and all the wrong, um, but at the end of the day, the University of Texas, that university, its reputation, it's important to Texas. It's really important that we get to the bottom of whatever we need to get to if there's something to get to the bottom of. And we protect the reputation of the university so it continues to be one of the most outstanding and finest universities. And a Board of Regent member, I believe, has the responsibility not to rubber stamp and go along. He's there to protect the taxpayers. He's there to protect the students. And um, so to get to the bottom of it, we're just going to see where all this plays out. And I also don't think that any legislator take advantage of his position and have a child of his or of a donor's get into a school when another child who was qualified didn't. And so we need, we need in the legislature to not just point fingers off the campus of the Capitol, but to look inside and make sure we're not part of the problem. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, you've got somebody that's acting as a fiduciary. As a fiduciary, you have every right and you have a responsibility to the people you're representing on that board to figure out what's going on. And when you get criticized for doing your job, not just criticized, but as Dan said, potential indictment, um, there's something wrong with the system. And so, look, we're gonna do everything we can to figure out what the truth is, because that's all that matters. We're not gonna take a side, but we are gonna find out what the truth is and do our best to do that, because that's what our obligation is. Here's a good one. Define what success looks like for your office over the next four years. Well, we have a lot of goals. We're going <coughs> to continue the, the, the great work that's been done by the previous commissioners on, on uh, border security that, that Todd Staples did. I, I get that. I was chairman of the Homeland Security in the House, so I already have those relationships with the farmers and ranchers and the sheriffs down there. Uh, but we're going to expand not only marketing Texas agriculture products at home, uh, but abroad. I have trade missions set up for South Korea, China. Malaysia, Taiwan, Cuba, and we'll continue to expand that and take Texas products around the world. By, and by doing that, we'll create more jobs and economic opportunity. I have a real concern about uh, uh, our rural, uh, the Texas Department of Agriculture's charge with the distributing uh, rural health care throughout the state. And I, I, I know for a fact that we're lacking there. Uh, we have areas that, that are un unserved or underserved all throughout the throughout the state, and we need, need to do a better job for our citizens with that. Uh, I intend to be as the, an ag commissioner that is a better protector of the consumers in, in this state. 
uh, we're going to do a be better job of uh, catching crooks and thieves that are, that are, that are cheating our taxpayers. Uh, we, I've got a whole long list over there, but, uh, but my, my ultimate goal is when I leave that office to have been the best agriculture commissioner that Texas has ever had, and I'm zero in on that and that item only. Yeah, it's, uh, to me, it's real simple. It's customer service. We work for the taxpayers. And I have reinforced that over and over and over again as I've been out talking to people that even though we are the tax collectors, can you imagine running for that job? <laughs> but the fact is, is I have reinforced over and over that we work for the taxpayers, not the other way around. And that means that they deserve the respect, they deserve the answers timely, quickly, and if you look at this office with the 20 divisions that we have, we really are to focus on really three core constitutional duties. That is the collection of the taxes that are due and not anything more. That's focusing on a real accurate revenue estimate and that's handling the treasury. And in the 21st century, there's one thing that didn't get included in the constitution and that's called security, data security, because we have a lot of sensitive data. And so if we do those four fundamental things, we have been successful. And so the customer butter. service is top, first, and foremost. And, uh, as Sid said, um, my goal is to be the best lieutenant governor in the history of the state, not for my own legacy, but because the people of Texas and the senators in the Senate who I serve deserve no less. Those of you in this room who voted for me didn't say, you know, if we vote for that guy, I think he might be the sixth best Senate, uh, Lieutenant Governor in the history of Texas. And I would want the person who succeeds me to think the same thing. We should be improving the quality and integrity and character and expertise of the people that we send to office with every election. Um, I will tell you this week that the presence of God has been in that capital. I, I had the privilege of of uh, being a part of his swearing in, of his swearing in, and his swearing in. And all three men, myself included, put our faith in Jesus Christ first. Um, we laid hands on Sid. When's the last time that's happened in the house? Um, I had a few that I wanted to lay some hands on. <laughs> The sergeant at arms stopped me. <laughs> and, and so, you know, for me, uh, Matthew 20, 27 says, for those who offer themselves up to lead, you must first be a servant. Yes. And so I must first be a servant to Christ, to the people of Texas, and to the members of the Texas Senate. As I said today, I can lay out the vision. I can help guide. I can help assist. But at the end of the day, the specific public policy that's written will be written by senators. They will pass the bills and they deserve the credit for the bills. So I'm there to serve. And so that's, the, the, I want people to say, Dan was a servant. You know, we, um, we have almost 4,200 employees in the Attorney General's office and we do some really important things like collect child support. There's many women, women and men across this state that depend on us to do a good job. And I think, when I leave this office, my hope is that each of these employees of the state, AG's office, cares more than they did and cares about making a difference in these people's lives. Because for some of these people, that's the only contact they're gonna have with our government. And it really matters how well we, how, how well we do. I, I didn't admit this in the campaign, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it. I grew up in California. <laughs> My father was an Air Force pilot, so I have an excuse. I live in eight states. And I came to Texas because I saw Texas, I'm not gonna say I thought it was the prettiest state I'd ever lived in, but I, I thought it was the most beautiful because it had the best people, it had the best environment for somebody like me who wanted to work hard, who wanted opportunity, who wanted to make my own way. And I'd been in New York, I'd been in Florida, I'd been in California. This was the best place to live because of the people, because of the environment, because of the opportunity. And four years from now, despite the depressing assault by the federal government, I hope we can all say 
that we have more freedom now, more freedom in four years, more liberty, more opportunity than we do now. And And finally, this is a life goal, not just an AG goal. When I cross that line four years from now, or eight years from now, when I cross that line to life, I want God to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Will Texas be able to keep its spending below the spending cap this coming year? And how will you reform government in your departments to save taxpayers money? You know, I, I was, this is a critical issue. For the years that I was in the legislature, I tried to pass unsuccessfully, but really thought it was important that we limit our spending to population plus inflation and take the rest of the money. And they're, because of our very smart conservative comptrollers in the past and in the future, typically the comptroller is pretty conservative on that estimation, and we can't spend. The legislature can't spend more than what that estimation is. Whatever the comptroller certifies on Monday, the legislature, that's the number they spend. And typically, they're fairly conservative. And that ends up being to our benefit because we end up having the surplus. And the, get, the idea here is if we can keep our spending down, that money should be t returned to the taxpayer in the form of tax cuts, like property tax cuts. We should, with that money over a period of time, and this was a TPPF idea, and it was presented years ago, and had we done it years ago, your school property taxes could be largely gone at this point. So if a Republican legislature will actually do that, in 10 to 15 years, your school property tax could be gone. And not only does that make it easier for you, but that makes it easier for people who are on fixed incomes to stay in their houses and not have to get rid of them. It makes it easier for manufacturers to move to the state and create jobs. It is, there is no downside to this. And it needs to be done by a Republican legislature. And um, you know, I'm committed to making my agency as efficient as I can while still maintaining quality service and maintaining the opportunity to take on the Obama administration. Well, I think every year that I've been in the Senate, seven years, four sessions, or most of them, I've filed the bills to keep our budget uh, it's no more than population inflation. They haven't moved. Uh, I have a feeling that whoever files that bill this year will have some movement. Um, Thank you, Dan. But, and I talked about this today as well as part of the vision for this year, to, is that we have to define what that is. And I've been talking with some of the folks at T TPF and my budget director has, because a couple of years ago, when Steve Ogden was still chair of education, I mean, chair of finance, he had 10 or 12 experts in to talk about what population inflation really was. And they had 10 or 12 different answers. And he said, well, if you all can't figure it out, I don't know how we go about that. Now, I just kind of use some cowboy math, because some of the numbers we get is, is pretty high. Um, what's the inflation rate in America? the general recognized number, 3.5%, somewhere in that neighborhood. Population increased about 2% in Texas. So you can take that. Um, but we have to come up with a real number. And one of the things that's been talked about, I'm, just, I'm not saying I support this or don't support it, but it's an interesting thought is, if you look at population inflation, but because of Obamacare, the cost of medicine continues to skyrocket, it's going to artificially, I mean, it's a real dollars we have to spend, but I don't necessarily want to set a budget of population inflation if the cost of Obamacare in the years is driving that number sky high. So we have to figure out what that is and make it the lowest number possible. Um, and, and we have to do what TPPF and you've talked about, about um, over a period of time, retiring it and getting rid of the property tax uh, by you know, just spending the money that we have wisely. Bring it back to tax yeah, for, for me, and, and not to be con completely repetitive over and over again, but it it's focusing on, again, those three constitutional duties that this office is charged to perform. And then also having to deal with the data security that we have these days. And so for me, improving the efficiency in our office, making sure that as we're looking out into the rest of the state, the other state agencies, that as we see opportunities for those efficiencies, that we bring them forward. As you look into the 21st century, 
that you, you improve the capability that you have today of how you communicate with the taxpayers so they have all the information they need. You are open, let's see that word transparent, in government of how your dollars are being spent. Again, as we go all the way back earlier to a topic earlier, that it's our money, it's the taxpayer's money. And so I think this agency, over the course of the next four years, did you improve the efficiency of the agency to advocate for the customer who is the taxpayer and for your responsibilities and not get distracted by, hey, Dan, could y'all pass a bill and give me a new program? No. Actually, we got some programs we don't want to do anymore because we have to focus on those core basics. Chad, you know, we, we, I've definitely you know, haven't been on the job that long, but I've already targeted some areas that we can uh, find some efficiencies in, some modernization that will give us some, some good cost savings. Uh, but one of the first things I did is I called the state auditor and requested the state auditor to come audit me. Uh, I don't know, hope, hope we don't find anything inappropriate there, but if, but if it is, I want to know about it and I want to correct it immediately. Uh, if we've somehow been squandering the taxpayer's dollars, my understanding is that no one can tell me the last time the state auditor audited the Texas Department of Agriculture. So that was the first measure that, that, that I put in and then talked to Brooke, back to you. What an incredible and inspiring evening. Thank you. Just phenomenal. In hearing about all the different ideas, it struck me. How many of you are here just for this evening? How many of you came to the event just for this evening to hear our newly elected leaders? Welcome to you all. I, uh, Senator Patrick, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, they are here from all corners of the state. And I think it is so reflective of how truly inspired and excited we all are about the next phase of Texas. And, you know, I say this over and over, but it just bears repeating again and again, especially for those of you who are new. We are proving every day in this state that less government and more freedom serves the least fortunate among us. And when you have the state of California with 52% higher taxes per share, and you have the state of California with a 50% larger state government, you have a state who is following the path of Washington, D.C. And you have a state of California that has 47% more people in poverty than does California. If you really, than does Texas. It's been a long day, my friends. <laughs> But it is so important to remember when we're talking about servant leadership, Lieutenant Governor, and we're talking about doing the right thing, General Paxton, and we're talking about making a difference and serving the customer, Comptroller Hager, and when we're talking about uh, the great agriculture industry, which as an ag major from Texas A&M and a future farmer of America, I can so appreciate. When we're talking about all of that, we're not just talking about today and what's happening today. We're talking about not just the future of our state, but the future of this extraordinary country that is now depending on us. So for those of you that came in all the way from all corners of the state to hear what the future leaders of our state look like, I hope you go home tonight or tomorrow completely reassured <laughs> that the Texas we know today will be a stronger, more vibrant, and better Texas tomorrow. Please help me thank all of our wonderful panelists and everything we've done. Thank you. Thank you.